I'm John Travis in Novato, California on the 1st of June with Irv Katz, also in Novato, who lives in the same community I do. Uh, welcome, Irv. Glad to be here. Did I say it's 2020? I'm not sure if when I uh, added the date, but uh, here we are in the middle of the pandemic, lockdown. Saw you at a distance last night, but uh, what I want to do today is learn about your your illustrious career, what led you to do the things you've done, uh, particularly in early motivation. So let's start with where you were born and um, how it was growing up and parents and siblings and all that. I was born in the South Bronx, New York. So I'm a New Yorker, all right? Yeah. <laughs> Which can tell you a lot if you stereotype it all, of course. Uh, but it was definitely an influence. Uh, I was born to immigrant parents uh, who basically didn't speak English well. And so uh, I was born in a tough neighborhood. The South Bronx is one of the toughest neighborhoods in the country. Uh, and we also uh, were very, very uh, delinquent in many ways, in the sense that uh, we had block wars, we stole from the uh, candy stores and the five and 10 cent store, uh, things of that nature. Uh, and also parents didn't have much influence on us because they uh, didn't really know how to speak or know much about the culture. Uh, so a lot of it was peer influence. Uh, and peer influence at that time was really fights, power struggles, Etc. But at the age of nine, I moved to a middle class, lower middle class neighborhood where the interest was not in fighting, but in education. We made our points by, Western, by our educational achievements. Mm. So I became very interested in school and I had to be very good at it, even though the competition was extensive. Uh, these kids were bright, they were Jewish. They were basically, again, also educationally oriented. So strong influence in terms of education. And I got my points. I got my, I think, self-esteem from being a good student. Now, this was in the, in the early depression, right? You were born in- the... I was born <laughs> in the depression. I was born in 1929, right, during the depression. So we went through the depression years, uh, which was, not easy at all because we didn't have the food or the monetary aspects yeah. that uh, most kids had or some kids had. And so uh, it really got a chance to get an education on how it is to be poor, how it is to be in a depression. And how, uh, what did your father do and they had siblings? Uh, my father was a really skilled artisan. I didn't have any siblings. I was the only child. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, it's interesting. My father was one of eight. My mother was one of nine of these 17 siblings. None of them had more than two kids. I was that. <laughs> <laughs> and I think because growing, uh, they, they came from farms. That's why the large family. Yeah. But when you're in an urban environment, the having children is costly. And so uh, that was an interesting phenomenon. So we got a lot of care in a way because our family was relatively small, but we didn't have the brothers and sisters that many families had. So you're uh, now moved to a, a better neighborhood and still in, in the Bronx? We moved in a better neighborhood in the Bronx and uh, we were definitely uh, educationally oriented. And I happened to be skilled. Uh, my father, was a skilled artisan. He was a sheet metal worker, made beautiful uh, <clears throat> designed apparatus for uh, stores, restaurants, etc. So uh, he uh, was very skilled in that area. And really, the whole intention of, of having children is to make sure that we got the education they didn't get. So the emphasis on education was very strong. And so I graduated early. I skipped a year. Uh, 
At the age of 17, I went to college, just barely 17. And I went to Michigan State University, uh, really uh, quite a good school at that time, so it is. And uh, I started off in, of all things, uh, electrical engineering. Really? Yeah. I, I, <laughs> my cousin was an engineer, so uh, I figured that's the way to go. But I soon found that I was more interested in humans than I was in uh, bridges and making bridges and so forth. And so I was switched over to industrial engineering. Uh, but I started taking psych courses and I found, well, my really interest was industrial psychology. Then I started taking courses at clinical psych and I found, and I finally majored in clinical psychology. Etc. You never heard of industrial psychology? Was there the psychology of industry? Uh, my, a lot of it was motion time work, it's oh. industrial, but it's really the efficiency yeah. in of humans in yeah in industry in business etc. Uh, it, it was fascinating to me, but clinical psych definitely was more fascinating. Mm -hmm. So you did four years at Michigan State. I did, yeah, actually three and a half. I, even though I, I oh. lost credits by transferring, you know, these transfers, I still uh, uh, <clears throat> was able to uh, master the subject, so I graduated early. And mm -hmm. that could lie. And then I went to Penn State University for my master's degree, and I graduated in one year and decided to go back to Michigan State. I realized I really liked Michigan State University. And I went there for my doctoral degree. Interesting. Turned into a Midwesterner, huh? Yes, <clears throat> definitely. For that time, anyway. So you got your <clears throat> PhD in clinical psych. Right. And then, then what? Then I decided to go west. <laughs> okay. Ah. So a position opened up of all places at a university. Uh, that was just starting in Las Vegas. And also I had some connections with the school system too. So it was a joint uh, appointment that I had as a school psychologist and also starting the Department of Psychology at UNLV. Uh, and so I uh, a professor wow. uh, there after for 13 years. I thought I only say, I thought I'd only go west for one year. But it was interesting to go into uh, an area that is just blooming. I think they had 50,000 people in the whole area. And now, of course, they have a couple of million. So interesting to see a place grow up, a university grow up. And I found that when we were a small university, I would uh, call up the guy from the head of audio visual, say, uh, John, I need uh, this video uh, this film at uh, this and this time. Fine, good, I'll get it to you. But then we got larger. And so this is an interesting lesson. As we got larger, well, then we had to be uh, put things in terms of uh, a requis uh, requisition. Uh, and then we had to do a requisition in duplicate. And then we had to do a requisition in triplicate uh, way ahead of time. So I was waiting for this film to come in and apparently I had not filled out one of the forms correctly according to them, so I didn't get the film. So that, that stopped me from, it was just too much. Uh, many people have said, and I think there's something to it, what's going to bring the world down is not the virus, it's not all these riots, it's not uh, our uh, <clears throat> competition in the world uh, as Russia or China or whatever, it's going to be red tape. <laughs> and I think red tape is a huge problem uh, in these United States. Uh, I'm dealing with it now in terms of getting a, uh, a loan from the government. And the forms you have to fill out, unbelievable. You fill it out, well, you forgot to do this section or you didn't do this correctly. Red tape is one of our big issues. So. Mm -hmm. and also, I found out, too, uh, that when we were a small school, I could teach educational psychology and that's social psychology as part of our curriculum. And we brought in the education department and the joint programs. But as we got bigger, as we got departmentalized, 
we found it was more difficult. And I said, no, you can't teach that site. We have to teach it. It's our course. No, social psych, that's sociology. And then, <laughs> I still can't believe this, we, uh, one of our professors said we should teach a course in sexuality. I think it's an important area. Actually, it became required for clinical psychologists to have a course in sexuality. But we got objections from the sociology department. They said, if you teach a course, just deal with masturbation, two people, you know, uh, but if you go beyond two people, it becomes, you know, our province. So you can't teach anything that goes beyond, you know, the matter of individual sexuality. This is what happens at large universities. They mm. get departmentalized. Uh, they get more strict in red tape. And I think it becomes a problem. Uh, as you see now with the COVID virus, uh, that... Uh, large universities, someone said they're going to go the way of, of large malls. Uh, and uh, so that there are some limitations to largeness. So I started a school uh, as a result of that, 1988, 32 years ago, a school that was uh, small, relatively small, uh, one with low tuition compared to the ones with large tuition. Uh, and also individualized and mentor-based, and it's going strong. Uh, it's really, I think, meeting the needs. In fact, in a sense, we were ahead of our time. A lot of universities now are going our way. The program was called At a Distance. Uh, we use the media as we're using right now uh, to really reach our students, uh, as many, of course, universities are doing of, of necessity, of course, but we did it as a practice that is very valuable, mentor-based. And so I think I learned a lot about uh, how to run a university based on the examples I had of how to run it, being involved with large universities. So now how long were you in Nevada? I came just for a year. I ended up being there for 14 years. 14 years. And then, then what? And in those 14 years, by the way, I should cite some examples that I think are valuable. I was part of the Witchy Commission, uh, Western Interstate Commission on, uh, uh, on higher education, but we were a subdivision of them in terms of mental health training and research. So I set up mental health programs throughout the 13 Western states. Uh, and one example I had was I've set up marriage from family counseling programs. And, and doing that, I met a, a Dr. Bell, who was a well-known marriage of family counselors. And he said, you clinical psychologists do not necessarily make good marriage and family counselors. Now what? Look, our training is, I think, in any way superior to yours and so forth. He said, that's a problem. And that is, you are too into looking at, examining, doing testing relative to mental health problems. And in many instances, marriages, some of the problems should be left alone. If you have a, uh, a couple that are into sadomasochistic issues and they're working that well, it's working out for them, leave it alone. You don't have to treat every illness just because you see it. So I learned a lot about just working with what is rather than going into what I, as a psychologist, thought was a problem. Mm. So, uh, and, and you learned that while you were still in Nevada, or is that, did that come later? Yes, because I was part of the Witchy Commission, representing oh, right, Nevada, yeah. and yeah, I learned yeah. a lot, really, regarding that in terms of how to set up programs and be pertinent, be aware, wise, and smart about whatever you're doing. There's a tendency, and this is true of psychologists, true of physicians, and that is to not really stick to what is the issue. Rather, you know, you go ahead and do what you think you're skilled in and trained in, which yeah. may not well be. So uh, I learned that as a person who got involved in terms of my own health. I had a massive heart attack 15 years ago. Uh, and 
uh, I thought I had as many men do heart heartburn, et cetera, but they did a uh, exam which indicated I had actually two massive heart attacks. And of course, then I went to the hospital and uh, they wanted at first to do a, uh, uh, I'm trying to remember what the term is right now. It's what happens when you get to be 90, which I am. Uh, memory is not as effective. They wanted to do a stint. Mm -hmm. And then when they attempted to do the stint, they found that my left arterial artery was completely blocked. And so at that time, they weren't sure when it's completely blocked to do a stint or not. In fact, they were doing research and they wanted to be part of the research where they choose whether they put a stint or not in, in terms of doing adequate research. I said, no, I don't want to have an informed decision. And I looked it up and I found that, well, I could do without a stint, that there's no indication and that's why they were doing the study. Uh, so I didn't do a stint uh, and I didn't stay long in the hospital. Uh, I didn't do some of the drugs they wanted me to do. I just did, went into alternative and integral health. And I haven't had a heart problem since. And you probably developed good collateral uh, circulation around right. the blockage. Collateral yeah. arteries took over yeah. and my heart condition. It's, uh, it's fine. <laughs> One other story relating to that, and I talked to my cardiologist, and he's been very surprised at how healthy I've been, uh, et cetera. And he said, you know what your ticket to health is? I said, no, what is my ticket to health? He pointed to my wife. <laughs> ah. uh, I think yeah. that was the key element in my health, in my living to 90 and fairly good health is my wife. Uh, and who not only takes great care of me, but having a loving relationship yeah. is a huge element. In all He's that. a gem, I know. Okay. So, uh, after you left um, Nevada, what, what was the next chapter in, in your saga? Yeah, after I left uh, Nevada, a um, uh, position came open in San Francisco area. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, the university I was uh, working with, uh, it was a uh, university that was uh, basically uh, innovative uh, and I wasn't in, in terms of a large university. Uh, I'm trying to think of the name of it right now. Uh, it's well known, Yellow Springs, Ohio. Antioch, yeah. Antioch. So I really became the primary professor at Antioch University. They wanted me to take over the school, but I didn't want to get involved with in administration. So basically I became one of the uh, professors and I was innovative in what I did. I did a lot of retreats uh, at Wilbur Hot Springs, uh, at uh, um, programs where we could meet, you know, in a setting where we were doing mass learning, meeting overnight, et cetera. And I found that was very effective. And we do that at IUPS, might have got a plug in there, International University of Professional Study that I started in 1988. Uh, and so we are high on retreats, on workshops, where you really get down to the nitty gritty of a program and interaction in a way that supports the learning process. So, I learned a lot in my uh, many years as a professor, and that is to utilize what is the best uh, programs that will bring about the kind of results that ought to be done, uh, performed at every university. And it's interesting that right now, university, because of the expediency, uh, are now getting into programs uh, that are utilizing, as we are not now, uh, technology that really brings the classroom to the individual rather than going to a large classroom, getting a parking spot, uh, et cetera, being in a class of several hundred or more. I remember when I was one of these large classes, uh, I, I would <laughs> go to my watch and couldn't believe that it was still working because time seemed to go very slowly. Mm. 
Now, I'm curious, uh, I know somewhere along the way, you and Susan Campbell uh, met up because I've interviewed her and we talked about you. And of course, I've known her for a long time. And uh, where where in the sequence did you meet Susan? And I met Susan, I'm trying to remember how many years ago, quite a while ago. We were at a work, we were at the APA, uh, American Psychological Association workshop in, uh, Hawaii, of all places. And I was attracted to her. Well, she was a queen, as you could expect, you know, of the APA uh, <clears throat> group. And, but uh, I indicated, which usually I, I'm not that forceful, uh, and I uh, never wanted to meet with her. And uh, she said she was busy at that time, she was actually with someone, but we met, and the upshot it was, I suggested we both take a leave of absence. I was then a professor at uh, uh, <clears throat> UNLV, and she was a professor at University of Massachusetts. That we go take a leave of absence and go to San Francisco and uh, check that place out. We did, and we happened to be right across the street uh, from a starting university. Antioch was going to do a subdivision there in. San Francisco, we started the teaching, the two of us. And then we started doing workshops also uh, uh, in terms of uh, the West Coast and really enjoyed the West Coast, enjoyed each other. We had rented an apartment, etc. And I think we learned a lot from each other. So this was at the end of your time in Nevada, that just before you moved permanently to San Francisco? Yeah, when I uh, came back to Nevada, I decided to leave. Uh -huh. And that's and I decided to go up to San Francisco and continue my uh, teaching in mm -hmm. New York. So uh, I found San Francisco a wonderful place to be at. And what I, year was I that? Enjoyed when, it. when you went there, do you remember? Uh, I don't remember the year. Uh, uh, well, I know that uh, 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 Will, it, was, it was around the 1970s, right? I know I Will Schutz uh, was teaching there at uh, in the late 70s and invited me to guest lecture to his class. So, and you you knew Will, and unfortunately, I couldn't interview him before he died. I'm going to interview his widow at some point, but uh, uh, tell me a little about Will Schutz since we can't interview him directly. You, uh, I gather you knew him pretty well. Yes, I got to know him quite well. And while I was at uh, Antioch, uh, he went even further than I did. He wanted to establish a program. And in that program, it was really one big workshop, <laughs> basically. Uh, and Will was a really uh, innovative and uh, instructor. And I approved of what he did, because uh, he went even further than I did. Now, I did workshops. But he did one big workshop as a way of teaching. And so I, and I think the students appreciated him. He was innovative, uh, sometimes really uh, very unique in what he did. But he had a good sense of teaching and how to establish. He was a great workshop leader. So uh, Will really established a good program in that way. And probably for viewers down the line who may not have heard of him, he actually, I consider that he invented the encounter group. I, there were the tea groups at, uh, um, out east, but uh, I know he uh, started that at Esalen. And I remember reading about Esalen in Life magazine when I was in high school, <laughs> thinking, well, you know, this is kind of weird. Never knowing that I was going to meet the guy later on and he'd become a good friend too. But uh, uh, he was pretty radical in his um, and open with the, the sexual components in an era of the 60s when before the sexual revolution, which I think he had a, a major part in bringing that about through his uh, encounter groups and so forth. But um, <clears throat> would you agree? Is that, th that how you uh, picture it? Oh, yeah. And I think the encounter group was really one that was innovative and very helpful. Uh, and Carl Rogers proved of it. Uh, and I uh, well, got involved with encounter groups. And I found that, that uh, it was a very useful way for individuals to 
be able to um, uh, utilize innovative processes. I think it was, it was valuable while it lasted, and Will Schutz was definitely an innovator in that. Yeah, I, I witnessed when he took it into corporations <laughs> with his FIRO test. Uh, he, he needed an extra body for one of his workshops when he was starting that. And I watched him take a room full of uptight executives <laughs> and turn it into an encounter group and one evening down in Carmel Valley uh, through filling out that questionnaire. It was amazing to watch what he could do with a, a group of uptight professional, uh, um, I don't know what careers they had, but they, they were new to all this. So. Uh, how long were you at Antioch then? How, how did that, tell more about that program. Yeah, I was at Antioch for quite a while um, because uh, we decided uh, to open up Antioch in uh, Hawaii. So I went to Hawaii and opened up Antioch University uh, in uh, uh, Oahu. And we had really a quite a uh, successful program there. I also talk, taught at some of the Antioch uh, subdivisions in Los Angeles and Seattle. Really? Uh, I didn't know yeah. they had all those branches. They had quite a few that I went in Philadelphia. Oh. Antioch really was a very innovative and still is uh, program. So I really liked being in uh, Hawaii, and uh, and my daughter decided she wanted to live with me, and that time she was a sophomore in high school, and this tells you something about Hawaii, uh, you know, the uh, multitude of uh, nationalities and cultures, and I checked it all out. Uh, sophomore year, anyway, is a difficult one for women, particularly for girls. And so I found that it would be difficult for her to um, be able to uh, really be uh, comfortable uh, on Oahu in a uh, high school there. So I decided to move back to where she was living with my ex-wife in San Diego. And I got involved with a school there, the Professional School of Psychological uh, systems, PSPS. And so, and that also was innovative. Uh, they got uh, accredited by the state of California. And this is an interesting story. And that is, I tend to notice whether it be uh, uh, someone who is uh, just starting a program or someone who has just some skills, um, just like Susan, obviously, I, I saw her skills. And, we got involved and I followed her work and used her textbooks uh, as part of our program. Uh, and then uh, I came to San Francisco at one point, I was doing a, a Hawaii, I did a workshop and this um, woman came as part of it, she was dealing with breast cancer. Uh, and I noticed that she was really very skilled. Uh, so I said, why don't you come down to San uh, uh, San Diego, I'm, I'm teaching at a school there uh, and I uh, have a place open in my uh, uh, in my apartment complex I was living in. And so she came down and uh, did very well at school. And one day she comes to me and says, you know, I was just walking down a parkway and my eyes went up and down, up and down, up and down, and my disturbing thoughts left. And I want to do a dissertation on that. I said, why? That's crazy. I mean, uh, let me prove a dissertation because your eyes went up and down, et cetera. But she was so persistent. So I thought, well, it's not going to work, but she's going to learn something from that's the main thing about doctoral dissertations. You learn about research. It's not so much what you do, it's how you do it. And so, of course, she had a great deal of success, and that started EMDR. I move it desensitization reprocessing. And that was a, a, a PhD student of yours. I've forgotten her name. Uh, Francine Shapiro. Oh, yes. Yes. Well, that's historic because that's, uh, I remember Kaiser actually uh, approved of it and did research and it. Uh, mm -hmm. 
surprisingly well accepted in the mainstream. Interesting. Now, what years were you in San Diego, just out of? I think I was there early in the 1970s, in uh, 1980s. I would, uh, and then we decided. Um, that was after Antioch. Right, at, at Antioch, right. Uh, and so basically, uh, after a while, I went back to uh, Hawaii which I enjoyed tremendously. Uh, and this is another interesting experience I had recently uh, where I did a continuing education course for the psychologists, marriage and family counselors, social workers on the Big Island group of around 50 on multi-level counseling. And Hawaii is fascinating in the standpoint that and there's no nationality that is a majority. So people have had to find ways of getting along together. Uh, and so we had in this group, Portuguese, uh, we had Hawaiians, we had uh, Chinese, we had Japanese, we had about every culture that was represented. And so we went into depth about what each culture and what you need to look at to some extent if you're going to deal with that culture. At the end of the workshop, I said, it was money for shock value, forget what I said about all of these cultures. Really what I want you to do is basically see each person as an individual. Not how uh, all these Portuguese and I got to treat them this way or that way. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, uh, the lesson I got from marriage and family counseling, just deal with the individual and the issues they bring you, don't bring up your own, even though you're very skilled. You may be very skilled in working. In fact, you gotta go watch that. If you have certain schools, you may be drawn to utilize those skills. So when I see somebody as a therapist, I have, when they come to the office, I do very little way of testing. Uh, even though I had a broad background, years of testing when I went to school. Uh, and so, uh, I became very skilled in the Rorschach because I did Rorschach at Penn State, but they had a different method in Michigan State. So I took another year of the Rorschach and I don't, I don't use it now uh, because uh, it's a valuable test, but I'd rather see the person fresh as possible without necessarily a long history, without necessarily their nationality, without necessarily a, uh, a, uh, a great background uh, check on them. I think then I can meet the person as a person uh, and really meet them fresh and new without a minimum of preconceptions. Now, uh, uh, you mentioned uh, a daughter and an ex-wife along the way. Let's go back and fill in your, your social history of uh, any other kids and uh, how you met your first wife and what that was like. Okay. I met my first wife. One of the beauties of living in New York is that in the summers, we used to go to the Catskill Mountains. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a great place. It's, uh, it's uh, deteriorated somewhat since then. But at that time, you know, it was a great place for a young college student to work. So I became a busboy. I became a waiter. I, I became a purveyor uh, 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 <clears throat> and working with uh, boats. Uh, I, I mean, many uh, different occupations. And at one point, my, uh, my uh, first wife came to the, uh, the resort. Actually, it was a resort mainly for young married individuals, or couples rather, and, but they didn't know that. So she came with her girlfriend. So uh, we really got along quite well. And uh, I then asked her to marry me after a short period uh, of time. And we, uh, at that time, I went to Michigan State University and we were able to both have a really good opportunity to uh, have a, our married life start in a university setting, which was an excellent setting really to do with that. Was she involved with the school also then or? She went to the school herself, but, uh, eventually got a, uh, uh, 
a doctorate degree myself, mm -hmm. uh, etc. But then the seventies came. Okay, and my I have one daughter and one son, and they once did a skit about why we broke up, and they blamed it all on the seventies. Okay, uh, and um, interesting story here uh, at that time, and then as she got involved with the the open marriage, we started to have one. She got involved with the chairman of the sociology department. And uh, he was on the same floor that I was at, and he always would look away when he, I came along. And one day he came to pick her up, and I answered the door. And he was uh, not comfortable with that. So she kicked me out of the house. We were living together at the time. Uh, and so uh, basically, uh, I think the 70s was a, a really a, an important era for myself and a lot of us who lived in those times. We got up, went up to San Francisco, you know, with the peace movement and, uh, of course, the drugs that they got involved with later on. Uh, but I enjoyed San Francisco, and that's why I'm still here in that area. Now, uh, were you at the Summer of Love and, and uh, Kate Ashmore? No, I wasn't. At that time, uh, we took a trip from Las Vegas. Uh, we took pictures. Uh, we, we met with the individuals. We really appreciated at that time uh, uh, the summer of love was really an amazing experience. Of course, drugs got into the picture, unfortunately, and, and I think affected that, which shows you again the effect of drugs on our culture. But at that time, they were a tremendous example of how people can be. Uh, you don't have right now demonstrators, as they did, taking flowers and putting it into the gun muzzle of somebody there who was trying to keep order. Uh, they came from love mm -hmm. uh, and they came from uh, a different state and not affected, affected the police. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that they were able to survive a lot until they got into the drugs, then it became a different story. Mm -hmm. So then uh, you split up uh, when you were at uh, Michigan State with your first mm -hmm. wife? Say it again. You split up when you were still at Michigan State with your first wife and the sociology. Yeah, no, we had graduated, moved down to San Diego, where I was involved, of course, with with Antioch. Oh, okay. And then then we split up in the in the seventies. Yeah. So the the sociology guy was at San Diego, not in not in Michigan. Right. Yeah. Oh, okay. Any um, uh, and and. How old were your kids then, and what, uh, what's your relationship? Uh, my uh, daughter was four, and my son was 10. Uh -huh. And uh, are, you, are they still in contact, and what? Uh, oh, yeah, mean? definitely. Right now, uh, my son lives down. He's an IT person with uh, Mazda, and uh, my, <laughs> they're very different my son and, and my daughter. And my son uh, is uh, um, helping out right now, doing rewriting my website. So we are really, really a wonderful contact. My daughter who started to, uh, went to University of California and Santa Cruz and entered the park service. She's gonna be retiring in, in a month interestingly enough. Ah. Uh, and she loves the park service uh, in Santa Cruz, lives in Santa Cruz, and uh, we are very close. And so is my son. And so, you know, I have an excellent relationship with both of them and enjoy uh, our, our contacts together tremendously. Any grandchildren? Yeah, I have a grandchild uh two grandchildren uh a granddaughter who's 22 by my daughter and a grandson who's 15 by my grand by my son uh-huh so now we're um um in san diego you're on the faculty at uh the pc was it psps you said yeah that's the school 
The school uh, I was is, is IUPS, let's say the plug, International University Professional Studies. I'm the chancellor of the program. That's the one in Hawaii. That's the one in Hawaii, yeah. yeah. We're located in Makawa. So one of the things in order to have enough residency in the state, I travel to the state at least uh, three months a year for uh, different times. And so that's one of the uh, uh, duties that I have as, as chancellor to have sufficient time uh, on the island, which uh, of course I enjoy tremendously. Yeah, I, I wanna get up to there uh, uh, shortly, but I uh, wanna finish up with San Diego. So um, that's where you met Enula. Uh, so fill us in on, on the rest of your time in San Diego and-, and uh, Yeah, of course, when Enula is one of my students and uh, I, I remember that I was just so attracted to her that every time I looked at her, I would stop talking, <laughs> so I had to avoid her. And she sort of got a shock when she saw me. And so uh, I, I believed not getting involved with my students. Uh, and so uh, it was only after uh, I uh, decided to uh, uh, quit Antioch and uh, moved to back to uh, Hawaii. And uh, she decided to come help me in the move, although she paid her own ticket, as she said. <laughs> anyway, the, the story I have, this is 32 years ago, uh, well, 25 years ago, we met 32 years ago, and uh, she never left, <laughs> okay. Oh. And so we have this wonderful relationship, we got married, uh, in Las Vegas, of all places. <laughs> okay. At a wedding chapel? Pardon? At one of those wedding chapels? That was an interesting story in itself. And that is that we're looking for a place to die. We checked the wedding out, and of course, uh, in your, uh, you know, some of them were actually drive-ins. That was not for her. <laughs> uh, so we decided to be married. Uh, the uh, federal judge in Nevada happened to be a friend of mine, so we decided to be married by him. And when we came to the, uh, the place where they had the uh, courts, uh, someone had uh, phoned in a, a, uh, a death threat or a bomb threat, so we couldn't go in. Uh, so, but after a while we did, to make a long story short, uh, we asked him to do it, but he said, no, I'm too busy. I'm way behind in my schedule, et cetera. But we had invited people from different areas to come there. And he finally put his cloak on and we moved to a place not far down the road, uh, a casino. And it just had to be a casino that once we got a postcard that in the sent to a father that, well, yeah, maybe we get married there sometime. And so it happened to be the same one. We just happened to choose it by, by happenstance. Mm. So uh, we got married by this federal judge and that was a great experience. So that was 25 years ago, 95. And uh, you, you were finishing up, uh, I'm, I'm not following the transition from, uh, you went from Antioch to the uh, PCS, uh, PC, PSPS yeah. in San Diego and you, wrapped up there and and then you were doing Antioch in Hawaii before or after that? I'm, I'm not tracking the sequence. Yeah, we did IUPS when we moved to Hawaii. That, that's the one you started then afterwards? Correct. After PSPS, okay. Right. Now, what gave you the idea, given that you didn't like administration when you first went to Antioch, to take on such a task? Very good question, and I'm still wondering about it. <laughs> uh, actually, we had met some friends that I knew uh, had come to uh, Maui to start a university. Uh, and uh, he didn't know much about it, uh, but he felt that he wanted to do some research and starting a university would be a good 
avenue to do that. So we didn't know much about universities and I knew quite a bit. And so I began to help him. But after two years, uh, he decided to move away from uh, Maui and wanted to know if I wanted to take over. Uh, mm. And uh, for some reason or other, I, I did. And, I, I, uh, and, w and once I got involved with the university, it's like having a, a tiger uh, by the tail because it's hard to let go. And uh, we're a nonprofit organization and to deal with a nonprofit, you can't sell it and you have to find some other group to take it over and so forth. But it's been satisfying to us in many ways. Uh, and of course, I've really mentored a lot of students and the feedback that we get from individuals has been heartening. Wow, this is what, exactly what I've been looking for. I wanted a program that had a spiritual orientation as well as an educational orientation. I wanted a program that where I could work with someone like a mentor who could guide me rather than having a bunch of professors who really were uncoordinated what I did and so it's not conflictual about what they did. Large classrooms are certainly not the personal attention you would get from a mentor. I wanted a program where I could stay where I was and be able to do the whole program uh, uh, where I lived, stay with my job, stay with my kids, stay with my family, and still be able to do university work effectively. Mm -hmm. And we also allow for those who are able to, you know, for them to go to Esalen, uh, for them to go to different places and retreats. I, Elena and I were big on workshops and retreats. That's available to them if they're able to do that uh, physically, because sometimes we have people who are physically handicapped that are stuck to their particular home. So we have a versatile program, a program that the students very much appreciate, and it's heartwarming to get the kind of feedback that we get from them. And our students are out there making a difference on the planet. Uh, it's amazing what they're doing. Mm. Uh, and so, uh, but I'm 90 now, <laughs> okay? And uh, it's time for me to at least semi-retire. Uh, we're looking at somebody right now who looks like they're gonna be able to take over. And uh, I'm looking forward to retiring. And you and I live in this wonderful place. We ought to give a plug. Yeah, I wanna get into that, uh, but before, that uh, I, I can tell that Emil is in the background, and I wonder if she'll stick her face in the camera at least, so we can document uh, your Hi, better half. Uh, she <laughs> and wants, if she wants to sit in and, and join us too. Uh, and there she is. She is. <laughs> Hi, Jack. Do you want to say anything about the uh, the move to Hawaii and um, your your involvement in the university? Yeah, I'm. I would like to say something about Earth first. And Good. That is, uh, again, it shows that Earth doesn't have a big ego because he did so many things he didn't even mention. He was instrumental in the civil rights movement. Oh, really? He got the black. Yeah, let, let me tell a quick story about it. Can I do a quick story about that, honey? Yeah, can I finish this? Uh, uh, sure, go ahead. Just, uh, <laughs> just some examples. And these are just some. And sometimes I see and somebody says, oh, yeah, you were involved with this. And he didn't even tell me so all the achievements and all the service he did. He brought natural birth to the West Coast, Le Bazier. He invited him and uh, uh, con could educate physicians and convince them in that natural the birth. water boils the natural birth. And he put in uh, also his um, energy to get acupuncture uh, legalized or acknowledged. So, uh -oh. and he, he also yeah. helped the blacks having access to restaurant. So all these things he doesn't mention, and that speaks for him. But <laughs> and that's, well, these are just a few things. I'm, I'm glad you brought this in. I'm, I'm, yeah. I didn't know yeah. it either. I was part of the civil rights, interesting and pertinent to what's happening today. Um, I was part of, I was elected to the civil rights uh, committee uh, in the state of Nevada. And uh, we investigated what was happening in the casinos. 
they would not allow the blacks to go into the casinos. Really? A lot of the owners of the hotels uh, were concerned that if there was a black person uh, next to a Texas millionaire, that that millionaire would not, would object to it. I said, these gamblers, whoever they are, wouldn't even be concerned if there was an elephant next to them. <laughs> Their intent on gambling would not be a problem. But they resisted anyway, the owners of these hotels. And I said, well, if you persist in this, we are going to strike. We're going to have a, um, uh, our personnel and anybody who's interested in civil rights. And of course, they didn't want us to strike. Uh, they didn't want any, any negative publicity. So they allowed blacks to go into the casino. Sammy Davis Jr. was able to go ahead and gamble. Uh, now, I don't know if I read the blacks any favor, <laughs> frankly, by allowing them to go into the casino, but at least we were able to- the restaurants. Other yeah, well, yeah, they were able to go right. into the casinos or the restaurants and all of that uh, as a result of uh, uh, our pursuit of, of, that, of that freedom. Right. Yeah, and all the uh, programs you set up for gifted children and the, for different uh, handicapped and disenfranchised people, you set things up for them. So, just where, where was that? Just a remark. And also, he, uh, you know, he gave up his tenureship for just because he was in integrity uh, with. He wanted the new way. He saw what therapy works, the new way. He was involved in Esalen, and but he lost his his. Uh, well, I gave it out. Yeah, that's an interesting story in itself. You know, I was a uh, full professor, and I was tenured. You know, at, and uh, in San Diego. I decided to give that up because I also saw the limitations that the university got bigger and bigger, more departmentalized, more red tape etc. Uh, so I decided to, uh, which was amazing. <laughs> to, uh, when I did a testimonial for me when I was leaving, the uh, chancellor of the university said, Dr. Katz had the rock of Gibraltar. You know, he was security per se, you know, when you're tenured and so forth. Now, was this in Nevada or San Diego? This is in Nevada yeah, uh -huh. at the university there. Uh, and I came at really uh, I, uh, this other interesting story is that I had to make a decision. I also was very much involved with Vancouver in Canada. I really liked that. I did a lot of workshops there. Uh, we went to a island called Cortez Island mm -hmm. up uh, north of Vancouver Island where we had a workshops there. Uh, and so we did, a, uh, we did workshops on a barge. And so I, I, I had to make a decision. Should I go to San Francisco or should I go to Vancouver? Uh, so I spent a week in each place. I went to Vancouver and it was raining every single day. Yeah. Heavily. I went to uh, San Francisco and I went to spend some time at the bridge and it was beautiful. It was sunny. You know how it wasn't August, in other words. <laughs> right, right. So I ended up in San Francisco. Yeah. And also uh, maybe one more thing. Uh, Irv is a talent scouter, and you heard about um, seeing the talents of Francine Shapiro, who developed EMDR. And if Irv wouldn't have accepted her new idea, millions, actually millions of people wouldn't have been helped with this mm. EMDR soldiers. Many people all over the world, there are 100,000 trainers now. Really? If, yeah, so if Irv wouldn't have being open-minded and uh, seeing the, the possibility. He has that, um, the zeitgeist he knows, and he has, he is a visionary. Even so, when he was skeptical, he could see, see beyond his own limitations. Exactly, exactly. And then many, he also saw many people who are now in the forefront of the field, many of his students, and he's a catalyst a visionary and a catalyst. And along um, those lines, thank you, you know, uh, 
Fred Leboyer, you know, who is the one who did yeah, I people to birth. Talk about that, yeah, that's one of my main interests. Is oh, that good. Birth. Really yeah. interested in the story. I was uh, a key person in the Association of Humanistic Psychology, and while I was there at the office, and I set up the the, the conferences for AHP in Santa Barbara, and we were very much. Uh, we had some of the best conferences, over 1,200 people would attend. Uh, and uh, so uh, I uh, got this call and they said, we have federal boy in the East Coast. Would you like to sponsor him on the West Coast? I said, absolutely. I was really into what he do. And so when he came over to the West Coast, I presented him in front of, you know, pediatricians and physicians and so forth. And they were negative. They said, what do you mean? We need the lights. You can't have little lights, music, while you're uh, living a child, putting it in, a, in, in a, uh, a tub of water. We don't do that, you know, kind of thing. Uh, however, I got the mothers involved in doing it, and they, of course, established programs in different hospitals. Meanwhile, with Fred LeBoyer, I was also involved with rebirthing with Leonard Orr. Mm -hmm. I really appreciated what he was doing there. And I said, just why don't you come over and experience a birth? with this person. He was kind of skeptical, but since I was sponsoring him, he came over. At that time, they were doing rebirths in hot tubs. Mm -hmm. And while he had rebirthing, he had a horrible experience regarding his own birth. Uh, and so that's why he really established, you know, general birth, because every time he delivered a child, he would relive this horrible trauma he had as uh, uh, during his own birth. So it's always interesting to see how individuals, and I'm sure I am, and I'm sure you are, a lot of things we do are the result of some experiences we've had. Our gifts come from our wounds, that's how I look at it. Right, exactly, exactly. So uh, 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 Le Boyer's method has never really caught on as much as water birth has, but there's still, a, I guess, the they like the lights and the... Um, well, not all the, but it did make a difference in this area, and I think a lot of other areas. They allow fathers now into the birth rooms where mm -hmm. they didn't do at that time. They may not have gotten involved with the low lights and the massaging the child, although some places do. Mm -hmm. They certainly have changed their birth to be a yeah. much more gentle process, and they don't take the kid upside down and spank him anymore like they used. Yeah. Now, uh, we've mentioned uh, this community where we live, Marin Valley Mobile Country Club, which is a weird name, but a wonderful place. How did you wind up here? What, uh, what led you to, to get here? Yeah, that's a good question. We finally decided, living down in San Diego, that we really wanted to uh, move. We live in some beautiful places there, uh, but with mostly rentals, uh, and uh, we had some good renters. Uh, etc. But we decided that uh, we wanted to move into a mobile home. We had people who lived there uh, in the mobile homes and it seemed like a good way to go in a community kind of setting, um, etc. And we looked at a place called Contempo, which is yeah. down the road from here. Mm -hmm. And actually we put a bid on a place what that was accepted. But before we did, our realtor indicated that she smelled mold and so we got out of it but she said there was a senior place two exits above that maybe we want to take a look at and so we did and we liked it we liked the amenities you know our clubhouse is a beautiful place and swimming pool and jacuzzi etc you only saw it on picture you were very trusting. oh yeah then Inula came by herself and so uh, she said, would send me uh, pictures of the place. And uh, I liked the patio area, et cetera. And we decided to uh, move. The place was in shambles, by the way. <laughs> and um, I don't know how you think about it, but I feel when there are spirits in the house. And um, so you can cut that out if you want to. <laughs> oh, that's, yeah. Uh, and uh, it, w it looked like a dump. And so, um, and we had made an offer and then we took the offer away because uh, it, I noticed you could put a stick through the floor and you could see the ground, the earth. And then um, 
I told her this is not the place for us. But then uh, I woke up in the middle of the night and I knew we have to come here. And in the morning I called uh, our friend, a realtor, and she said, yeah, we said, no, it's already taken uh, by your friend. And so I called the friend and I said, this is a strange request, but tell me how much you want this place. <laughs> I really want it, but if, if you already have decided, because he had to decide between two places, then um, if you had already decided, then of course uh, I won't bother you. And he said, oh, you like it so much, take it. And Irv had not even seen it. He trusted it. And uh, yeah, I had a good sense about the place. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, we went ahead. And when we went ahead, it was interesting. There are, uh, you know, both of us are sannyasins, followers of Osho. Followers. And, and yeah, you know, the teacher. And so we didn't realize it, but, but uh, two other, three other, couples had already moved in and we bought it without even realizing that mm -hmm. uh, and, and then we moved in and others and now there are over 20 sannyasins living in the place so we have a wonderful community uh, of individuals who are sannyasins with different nationalities with great swedish uh, holland uh, uh, <clears throat> different places uh, as we uh, as they basically uh, have occurred and so we just love this place in terms of the community. People really are into helping each other. And you, Jack, have been a key person in, in organizing and uh, in recognizing the community aspects of the place as well as the amenities. You know, we have an incredible view of, 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 a, of the wetlands. Oh, you're a primo spot. In fact, we, we put an offer on the place next door to you right. <laughs> at one point. You're right there on the edge of the marsh. Now, what year did you move there? Or how long? Did you it's about around? eight years ago. Eight and years ago. one funny eight story, uh, quick story. Uh, we, uh, because we canceled the, the person, the realtor of the seller, uh, they decided to lower it 60,000. Oh. And uh, then suddenly it became affordable. We had only ten thousand dollars missing to pay it to buy it and uh, then suddenly I uh, I got some I got a check from the German government and uh, I thought it's about my former marriage and uh, the amount was exactly wow amazing exactly what and then they wrote me this, um, Six weeks later, and they said, oh, we made a mistake, but uh, if you don't have it anymore, uh, please send it back if you still have it. And I said, no, we bought something from it. <laughs> that's a no-brainer. <laughs> so that's we're supposed to be here. <laughs> now tell me uh, how you got involved with Osho. Was he Rajneesh still in those days? I, I, we missed that part of your chapter. Or your yeah, at that time, uh, when I finally... <clears throat> We went uh, around the uh, world honeymoon and stopped off at Pune. And when they, uh, I did my uh, entrance into the program, the, uh, they mentioned that Osho had been waiting for me for nine years. I, while I was in San Francisco and also San, uh, San Diego, I just hung around people who were, I, I liked who they were, and what they were doing, and uh, so on. And but I, at the same time, was not ready to uh, join the the program. Uh, it took me nine years to do that. And I, and I think Inula, I think he sent Inula along. Okay, uh. <laughs> was involved with the program. Spent nine years in Pune, and on and off. And so uh, that was the uh, <laughs> the drawing card uh, for me. And uh, uh, so that was Rajneesh, correct. And we just love uh, the uh, way in which Osho has uh, described uh, what life can be. Uh, and I should point out, too, that lately I have been going into afterlife. 
uh, we had a housemate who's really into that. She's also a psychologist and professor. Uh, a professor. And she had been, she does out of body experiences, which I'd like to be able to do, but haven't yet mastered. And anyway, so I got into studying uh, the last four years after life and basically I become aware that uh, we're here really to learn. We come into reincarnation for that. And actually, I've gotten into to some extent by virtue of, as a, I really became a hypnotherapist. My main teacher was Milton Erickson. Mm -hmm. uh, I uh, learned a lot from him. He taught at Michigan State University uh, and I got to visit him and learned a lot uh, from him. And while I was in hypnosis, I got into, and I learned that when people had past lives, there was some learning. But one of my problems and difficulties was sometimes was making decisions. So I got into a past life where I was walking along the shore in Australia. Uh, you love Australia, I know. And uh, while we're walking the shores of Australia, some my mates, I was a, I was a uh, um, the chief mate of a sh and a ship. And so uh, they said, you know, we're going to do mutiny and we want you to join us. In fact, you have to join us because uh, uh, we're going to be successful. And, uh, and they appealed to my manlyhood. Well, you know, you have that capability. You come with us. It's going to, you know, blah, 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 blah. And so I did. But the mutiny failed. And I had to walk the plank. <laughs> okay. And as I'm walking the plank, I said, oh my God, I gotta be careful of my, my decisions. I really have to watch what I decide to do. So when I came into this, uh, I became a number nine in the Enneagram and we had number nines, unless they master the process, um, have difficulty with decisions. So I find that past lives are very valuable, that we live in the afterlife and we come into reincarnation to deal with certain things that we need to learn in this lifetime. And that's one of the things I've needed to learn, to be able to be more decisive, um, many other things as well. So uh, and that has made a difference in terms of what I do in this lifetime. And then I look for the learnings. And when somebody dies, I recognize they're moving on to a fantastic life. The afterlife is amazing. I've been reading about it, videos about it, uh, about those who uh, know about it. And so you know, we, we dealt with a uh, situation this past uh, Sunday where we were doing a memorial oh, there was for one of the people here. I know. Yeah. And so uh, in the memorial, you know, yeah, I was, I was somewhat sad that he had, had gone, but I was also into being happy. To me, death is a celebration. Yeah. We're celebrating this matter of going into uh, the, where our real life is, which is the afterlife. And Life there is fantastic. So yes. we're here basically to learn about what it is we need to learn so that this is a great learning place. And we're learning a lot right now about race relations. We're learning a lot about authority. We're learning about giving up authority. Uh, we're learning about basically so many aspects in terms of how to deal with health. And I think I want to say this, uh, Jack, that I think the reason that I am now 90 in good health uh, is that I've combined natural methods with basically uh, the traditional methods, okay? So uh, I did when I had cancer twice, I did go into radiation, but I made sure that the radiation was not overly done. And I use alternative methods as well. Mm -hmm. uh, right now behind me, <laughs> okay, I have a electric uh, massage chair. Uh, uh, you can see it, yeah, let's hardly see it. And I recently had a visit to my chiropractor and he said that massage chair is working for you. You know, you had a place in your spine between the second and third vertebrae uh, that were obtrusive and it's gone down quite a bit and the whole area is softer. Mm. And we're also using some machine, maybe in your little more about it. Can you tell them about the machines we're using here? Yeah, we use uh, oxygen ozone. 
from longevity and my favorite doctors told me about it and uh, Dr. Rowan and uh, others and that's the importance of oxygen because you have sleep apnea and when you don't wear the mask or you don't have enough oxygen your body gets affected so we're using that and then we use a PEMF machine it's pulsed electromagnetic frequencies mm -hmm. and it's amazing what it can do and uh, oh, if you just a massage chair and we're using the supplements we look very carefully what's in there mostly natural and we cook everything from scratch oh my are you there mm -hmm. okay we can't see you anymore your screen favor may have come on yeah uh, well this has been delightful i need to wrap up um yes another uh, one thirty. but um what parting words would you offer for future generations and from your wisdom and uh, um, hopefully our viewers down the line will still have this available. Yes, I would say that a recognition, if you will, that one, uh, that we're here to learn and recognizing that whatever difficulties we have is really purposeful in terms of doing our learning. I've had a what people have called a charmed life, but I've also had challenges. And as I look back at my life, uh, as a hypnotherapist, as a clinical psychologist, uh, I'm utilizing more and more, going back to what I call critical incidents. And when we go to critical incidents, we can see where we're making decisions mm -hmm. in, in regards to how we're living our life. And these decisions many times limit us in terms of fear, in terms of avoidance. And once we resolve the issues, whether it be in a past lifetime or in a early life, a lot of cars at age four, I find, then we free ourselves and we learn from the experience. So I would certainly, as, as a message to others, uh, I'm a great believer in hypnotherapy and past life work uh, and learning about one's life in terms of what are the lessons that are there, both positive and negative. Uh, things that help our learning and accelerate our learning and that will impede our learning and deter us from developing the way we could. And not to be afraid of death. I think mm -hmm. death is really to be celebrated rather than to be uh, dreaded. So I'm looking forward to celebrating and helping people who come to my uh, funeral uh, I, I like what uh, Joan, one of our former members, she called it funeral. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay. <A little> funeral. <laughs> right. And Excellent. So, uh, I think a message is live life fully. You know, live life in terms of seeing it as a learning experience, see it as one that uh, we can evolve and develop even further in our attempts at getting in, quote, enlightened or at least. Uh, lightening up as yeah. far as life is concerned. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you want to add to that, Eva? Yeah, I like your, your uh, metaphor of lightening up, lighter, becoming yeah. lighter. And uh, I hope that um, you the can you see uh, can you see Irvini? Right yes. Now? Yes. Okay. okay. I my nose was itching. And I put my finger in my nose. I hope that didn't, didn't notice. <laughs> what? I didn't notice. <laughs> okay, but that's a learning to um, not to be concerned what other people think exactly. of us, of me. Uh, that's their business. <laughs> yeah. And to be natural in, in terms of health and terms of expression. And I'm very grateful to have Irv as my my life partner and just so grateful every day. What an incredible being he is. Great. Well, this has been a delight to get to know you both um, this much okay. better. So thank you again.
Oh, thank you. Okay. All right. Goodbye. Okay. Bye.